uh, Vietnam. And what was your branch of service, John? Uh, Air Force. United States Air Force. And your highest rank? Uh, I, I stayed in the Guard and Reserve after I got out of active duty and uh, retired as a Master Sergeant, E-7. Okay. And just, <clears throat> just kind of briefly touch on what are all the different locations that you've been? You did, you did um, like four years inactive, four years active, and then you did another 20 years or so reserves, is that right? Yeah, about 18 years old in the reserves. But I, I started out, uh, went in in May of 1964, basic training at Lackland, and my first uh, PCS move was to uh, Westover Air Force Base in Massachusetts, and I was assigned to the uh, 814th Combat Defense Squadron as an air policeman, which is uh, like a military police in the Army, the Marines. And our main uh, job up there was guarding aircraft. We had uh, alert uh, B-52s carrying nuclear weapons. We had uh, KC-135 tankers. We also had two flying command posts. So we had, there was probably, I don't know, in the flight I was on, we had probably had 40-some guys on duty just on the flight line itself. So I did that uh, from, that's stationary in November of uh, 64. And because it was a, like a direct duty assignment, ended up going to, uh, going to school there, did not go to a tech school. A lot of us went through training at Westover to become uh, proficient as a uh, air policeman. And during the time I was there, and I don't know what year it was, it might have been 66, that they changed it to, uh, to security police, renamed the career field. And I spent about from November 66 when I got, or 64 when I got there, to April of 66, I did the security work and then I volunteered to go to K-9. So I became a dog handler in April of 1966. And uh, was at Westover until probably December 66. I got orders to go to Vietnam. And in that time, I think it was November 66, they sent us to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas for a combat uh, school uh, and just taught us certain things we needed to know when we went into combat. And, uh, I'll get to it later, but one of the things I learned, I think, saved my life over there when I was in Vietnam. So, yeah. So, John, what, just kind of tell us, how did you, were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I enlisted. And what was your thought process? How did that go? What made you decide to join? Why the Air Force? Why not the Marines, the Navy? And how did your family, your parents, think of the idea of you joining? The Air well, my parents, uh, they knew I wanted to go in. They didn't want to sign for me. I wanted to go in Why? 17, but they said, no, no. So I waited till I was 18. But <clears throat> I, I did go see the Navy recruiter, and they took all the tests and everything like that for me to go in. And somehow I ended up wanting to go to, uh, to the Air Force, and the Navy recruiter tried to talk me out of it. He says, I'm going to take you to Westover. You talk to those guys up there and see what happens, right? So I go up there and everybody I talked to said, don't join the Navy, don't join the Navy. So I didn't. I ended up joining the Air Force. Uh, I actually went into the Army recruiting office and uh, when the guy told me he could have me on a train, a basic training the next day, I said, something's not right. No testing, no nothing. And so I decided, didn't want to do that. And then uh, I heard too much, so much about the Marines, I never even went to, to see them. You know, but that's how I ended up joining the Air Force. Yeah. And your your parents just they didn't did they care that you went in the service or because they didn't want to say when you're under eighteen. Right, but my my dad he was in World War II, so I was kind of in a way following in his footsteps, and uh, found out the Air Force was a very good choice for me. You know, I needed some discipline anyways. I you know, in high school I was not that good of a student and everything. But when I did go into the Air Force, I wanted to become a draftsman to start with. So when I went to basic training, they said, uh, 
They said I could take what they call a bypass specialty test and see if I had a skill level that I could become a draftsman because I did. I got four years of straight A's in high school on that. So I took the test and they gave me uh, our AFSCs started out. You had it was like a zero and then you got a three level when you finished school and stuff. So they gave me a three level just by testing me. But didn't need that, so I ended up uh, being a cop. But, you know, it worked out well for me for, for later on. So do you, do you remember leaving for your basic training? And what were your first days at basic training like? Was that challenging for you, or do you remember? Oh, yeah, I remember. I remember getting up. We were driving. We got up to the airport in uh, San Antonio, and this... Uh, we're driving. We're driving to the base. I mean, well, first of all, they had an area. I guess some uh, TI picked you up there, and you know, it was just started screaming at you right off the bat. And then all I remember is riding on the bus to to Lackland was the uh, the country music on the uh, on the bus the guy was playing. You know, but we all got there, and it was just uh, you know, physically, I had no problem with it. And it was just a mental game the whole time, and I really never had a problem in basic training. You know, just got through it. So, did you have to go to a special school? And in, in the army, they have AIT, where you get your job training. How did you get your job training as a uh, security police? Actually, uh, going to Westover, uh, they did the training right there at the base. They had a training uh, session, and I forget how many. There was a lot of us in in the, the course because nobody had gone to the school because I the school was only a few years old at Lackland and I guess a lot of people had they needed cops right away for because this was during the Cold War and everything so they just uh, you know they had some real good instructors there and talking to guys who came back from school at that time I kind of got the feeling that we actually were better trained than the guys who went to school really? you know I mean Maybe it's because of their experience. I, I, I really don't know. Yeah. Okay, so what was your, what was your, uh, tell me what your day was like at Lackland or at the, uh, after your basic training when you went to, what was Lackland you went to next? Well, Lackland is where we went to basic. And then from the, there you went to? Uh, well, I went to Westover. To Westover. Yeah. So what was your daily routine like there? Uh, well, when we first got there, it was just processing in and stuff like that, and, uh, you know, getting assigned where we were going to stay, what the barracks was. And then it was basically classes until we could get our uh, our skill levels. Well, it was classes along with guarding tankers because they wouldn't let us guard nuclear weapons until we had a three skill level. So it was kind of a combination of working the flight line and you would get assigned to a flight and I think it was... You worked, let's see, came in, worked three swing shifts, you know, like, I guess, four to midnight or three to 11. Then you transition into three midnight shifts and then uh, three day shifts, I think. I'm not sure if that was the sequence, but you worked like that and then you had like three days off in the middle, you know, and at the end of that. And then once we were trained, you get to three level and the five level. Later on, they did some more training. You had to take correspondence courses and uh, take some tests and stuff. So then you became, you know, you started guarding the uh, the nuclear weapons and not the weapons, but the aircraft which were loaded with nuclear weapons up here. And I don't think a lot of people knew about that, you know. And these are just aircraft that were... They were always kept loaded, just ready. They're loaded, they're sitting alert. You had to have uh, one person on each aircraft, too, as an entry controller, and then they had, like, boundary guards in the back for, I think it was one for four. So, and we had three teams of uh, guys in, in vehicles that were, like, a response team for each area. We had three areas, plus we have, had a reserve team that came off duty. They they get off at like, uh, say if you're working a day shift, these guys got off in the morning, but then they had to go stand by if you needed some more support. And then we had supervisors in the area too. So there was quite a few people involved in it. So you had a you had a list that you had to have for these guys on the aircraft to even enter the aircraft. 
you had to check them out with their restricted area badge and make sure that they were on a list. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> did you did your job there? Did they that your job require you to fly? No. Oh, right. You're just pretty much there on the tarmac. And the yes. Aircraft. Yeah. And if it got too cold out during the winter time, the chill factor would get down so much that they would actually put a truck there between, say, the aircraft, because you always had to have a guy, you know, one guy on, on each aircraft. But you could sit in that truck and keep warm, and you see somebody come up, you got to get out and do your job. So. So, what do you, what do you, next, you, you, is it next that you became a dog handler? Or you yeah. Volunteered? How, how did that work that you, that you volunteer? I know they just asking anybody or? Yeah, they it came down that they were asking for volunteers. I guess some guys get, you know, shipped out to Vietnam and stuff. And what happened was they weren't taking their dogs. So we, we had, and I don't remember how many dogs we had at Westover, probably a dozen or more, but they, uh. They were asked for people, so they interviewed you and uh, see if you're up to it. And one of the things the guy said in the interview says, uh, you know, by volunteering for uh, for canine, you're volunteering to go to Vietnam. I said, well, a lot of guys in security are going to Vietnam, so so that's how I got into canine. And then uh, I don't remember. I've got a thing somewhere in my files here about canine school. Usually they send everybody to Lackland for that, but uh, we had so many guys that were just coming from security that they actually sent two instructors up to Westover to train us there on site. So we got our training at Westover both as a so now both as the security police part and now as the dog handler part. Wow. Uh, and how long had you been in at this point? Is this like your second year? Uh, this is, let's see, 64, so 66. So I, I've been in just about two years when I went in K-9. Yeah. So tell me about that. How, how did you like dealing with the dogs? And did you have any experiences to share? Uh, as far as in at Westover, uh, we we're totally different than what I did in security. We were on the perimeter of the base. And we had a few areas that were on the base that needed to be guarded. We had a nuclear storage area that dogs would go out to. They'd bring us out there during daylight hours, and we'd just walk around. And then when it started to get dark, they'd pick us up, bring us back, and we'd take our dog out with us. And the only thing I remember happening at Westover that was really significant was they said that somebody had said that they spotted somebody in uh, in our storage area that they didn't know. know. Mm -hmm. So I think I might have been on CQ that night. I don't remember if I was working the area or what, but I had to go out there with my dog. We had to look for somebody, right? And we're going through these bushes and stuff. I had to get a new pair of boots and <laughs> fatigues after I get back because it was all briars and berries. I mean, I had all these stains on them and stuff, but we never did find anybody. It could have been an animal or something. Maybe somebody saw something like that, but we never came up with a with a person. But uh, it was just, it was a, a different thing. You, you you created a bond with your your partner there, your dog, you know. And uh, in the winter time, sometimes it got so bad that they would uh, take take us. We'd take the dogs back to the kennels. And we'd have to go. Uh, we'd have to go back on post because they couldn't get through the snow because it was too deep. The dogs were basically useless at that time, you know. So, yeah. One night I was on duty up there, and I can't remember. It had it, well. It was in '66, and I remember there was a. Uh, I was out in that nuke storage area, and they had a. Uh, there was a meteor that came down, and you can just see the whole sky light up. You know, we're watching wow. it and watching it. And I guess it was seen over the entire East Coast sometime in that. It was really something to see. Just, you know, I mean, everybody on the base saw it. But I know I was in K-9 at the time because of where I was. Mm -hmm. So it happened between April and December. <laughs> wow. That's something you see every day. No. No. So you, you had your dog. Do you remember your dog's name? 
Or my, did you work with different ones? You just uh, had one. No, I had one dog here, and then I picked up another one when I went to Vietnam. My dog here was named Zeus. And one of the funny things about Zeus was I was a second handler as far as I know because our one of our NCOs, who was a sergeant at the time, he had uh, picked up the dog when he went to school. And we had some wooden temporary kennels, and Zeus was on one of the kennels. For some reason, this dog chewed up a half moon outside of the kennel. I mean, off the side of the, it, it, you know, there were like uh, plywood kennels that they were living in. So he was, uh, he was something else. Yeah. He had a lot of excess energy. I guess so. <laughs> so from, from there, uh, you eventually came down on order to go to Vietnam. Yes. Okay, so tell, tell us how to... How did that come about? Uh, just, I got the orders. Uh, I was in duty one day, and they, they, they myself and three other guys uh, got the orders all at the same time. So we were all scheduled to leave together. And uh, my toughest part of that was trying to figure out how to tell my parents that I was going to Vietnam, you know, because it was a television war at that time, you know, so they saw all the stuff that was going on. So my parents took it pretty hard, you know, my sister, and she was, uh, my sister was probably, she was a teenager at the time. My brother was a little older than that, but, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of tough on them, you know, but I, I knew I was going to go eventually. So I kind of had that in the back of my mind. So I told a bunch of my friends and, you know. And what year was it? Was it 67? Well, this was in 66. I got my orders. And then I, I forget, sometime in 66, uh, I crossed out of West o Westover, and I, they said, you just got to wait for a telegram to tell you when to report. At that time, we had to report to Travis Air Force Base in California to, to go over. So I waited. I think they gave me a date, but they moved the date. I don't know. I ended up uh, leaving on the 18th of uh, January in 67. I, uh, myself and these three other guys who uh, got the orders we met out there and we all flew over together. We went over commercial airlines, continental airlines. And then uh, everybody, once you got over there, you found out that's what they called the freedom bird when you came back. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so during that time, when you're waiting on a telegram, were you intentionally on leave? Were you with your family? Or Yeah, I was, I was here, you know. Here in Connecticut. In, in Pequannock, yeah. Because yeah. we lived like three houses down from here. From where I where I'm sitting right now. I <laughs> wandered too far, man. Right? No, actually, these four houses were all part of the family years ago. Wow. This is the only one left now. So, yeah. so what was it like? You arrived in Vietnam. What can you remember? What was going through your mind? You got out there. Um, what, we arrived at the, yeah. We arrived at Tonsonut Air Base uh, at night. And the first couple things I remember was getting off the plane. Well, actually coming in, you could see flares, you know, the pop flares and stuff were the, you know, uh, and the heat, you know, the, I think it was, I don't, I don't think it was the monsoons, but it was muggy when we got off, you know, and then it, you had to do, had to go through customs, you know, because uh, the security police at the, uh, at Tonsonut did the customs thing. And then we got put in a uh, we got put in a transit barracks for a couple of days. And when I first got there, we had orders to go go to Pleiku, which was up in the Central Highlands. So I get there was a guy that uh, was walking by, and he saw my name tag and this other guy's name tag, uh, and he he said that. Uh, I saw the orders on you guys. I, I went up to play coup. I was supposed to be there, and you guys aren't going there. So uh, he says, when you get up there, they're going to tell you you're someplace else. So we waited. I think we were at Tonsonu for like three days, and we just basically hung around. There was no duties or anything. We are waiting to go. And they flew us up to uh, to play coup in a C-130, got in there, and they said, well, you guys are reassigned. You're going to Benoit which is down near Saigon, which was, you know, a, a short bus ride away. We we're about 20 miles from there. So we, we were looking for an aircraft to get a flight back. But we went to the uh, terminal, 
And the uh, guy says, well, we got a 130 here, uh, but I can only take two of you because uh, there was uh, four of us. And he says, because uh, we got, we got, it's all full of uh, KIAs, right? They have all full of coffins. So we all decided, no, we don't want to fly on a plane. It's got a bunch of guys who were just killed over there. So we waited till the next day, stayed in the barracks overnight. And actually met some of the guys that were at Westover with us who had gotten there before us. They were stationed at Pleiku, but uh, so they were, they were already there. And so we got on the C-47 the next day. And I remember taking off. We're heading back to Town Sanut. And the C... The C-47s had handles on the windows. Well, apparently the one I was sitting next to wasn't wasn't that good. I mean, it wasn't tight enough. So the window opened up as we're taking off, right? But we're not. It's not a pressurized plane or nothing. So I just I remember just reaching out, closing the window, and that was it. And we we landed in Tonsonut, got our orders, and then we uh, ended up going to uh, to Benoit on a on a uh, bus. They took us up on a bus. First thing I remember, bus is you get on there and there's all, there's all like, I don't know, for better word, chicken wire on all the windows. Mm -hmm. So if you got the windows down, you can't throw grenades in or something. But the only guy on the bus that was armed was the driver. So, yeah. So we're going up Highway 1 towards Benoit and you see these signs, you know, wash your Jeep for a dollar. The Vietnamese had all these little places, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you see guys pulling in with jeeps, then the the kids would take care of it or something. I mean, it was it was weird. It was different, especially when you got there. You didn't know much about it at the time. So then we arrived at Benoit. Oh, but going back, just uh, going back real quick to uh, when we left. It was kind of weird too because when I left, when we left Travis, we left on the 18th. And on the way over, we crossed the inter international date line. So I never saw the 19th of January in 1967 because it disappeared as we were flying over. And uh, when we got to Benoit, and uh, I don't even remember the in-processing portion there. We got assigned to the unit. They said that you may not go into K-9. And uh, I said, well, you know, that's what we were trained for, but they might have put us back in security, but we all ended up in, as uh, dog handlers. And then I uh, picked up my dog over there. Uh, I've got a listing, and I think I may have given to you, but it's got all the handlers that uh, my dog, Silver, 643F, is uh, was the dog I had over there. And uh, picked him up and worked with them probably about a week or two before we actually went on post, because... They were one-man dogs, so you had to kind of have the dog get used to you before you could go on duty. And, uh, and that just took about a week and a half, two weeks? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, Some guys didn't have, weren't as lucky. Some guys got bit by their own dogs before they could, you know, get that. But I, I was lucky. I never got bit by my, either one of them. And the funny thing about it is the dog that I picked up, here I came from Westover, the dog, Silver, that I picked up came from Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts. So we both came from Massachusetts and went to Vietnam and ended up together. That's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. it's uncommon. Yeah. And right now I still contact the guy who took Silver over from me. I get emails from him. I email him back, you know. So some of the photos you have are a combination of his photos and my photos of, the, of my dog. Yeah. So you, you've got your, your dog and... What did your, you and your dog do? What was your what was there, your purpose there in Vietnam with the dog? We had we we were in a sentry dog unit because uh, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of dogs that were used for different things. The sentry dogs were basically guard dogs and attack dogs. So uh, our training was not only uh, it was on the suit. I don't know if you've ever seen they wear this big suit and the dog attacks them. One of our instructors who actually was in the Air Force regulation for the dogs, because uh, he was at Lackland as a, as a trainer years ago, uh, developed this thing where he put a obstacle 
probably about this high in front of the guy with the suit, so the dog would go airborne before he hit whoever he was going after. So you get a 100-pound German Shepherd hitting a guy chest high, you're going down. But uh, yeah, my dog weighed, uh, he fluctuated between 98 and 105 pounds. So he was a good sized dog. And I'll never forget, uh, you know, they, we were always on post. We had 46 dog teams if we were, you know, everybody was on duty. But you'd work a week and maybe get a day off. And uh, one night I was on one of the posts and my dog started alerting. And I, I mean, you know, I'd only been there a, a little while. And I, I was really scared because you don't know what you're going in on. I didn't know the dog that well, so I couldn't tell whether he was, you know, alerting on a human being or an animal or whatever. Never did see anything, but, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was quite a feeling the first time when your dog alerts out there on post. Because we had 360 degree perimeter security with the dogs. Plus we had a bombed up area we did and some other sensitive areas on the base that people were using dogs. So I think uh, normally we had probably about 30, 36, 38 to 40 dogs out every night. Yeah. So you had the one incident where the dog kind of alerted on something that you, you weren't sure. Right. You never but saw anything. Never saw anything. So, you know, but there was animals running around out there and, you know, there could have been people there, but. You know, you never know. Did you have any other incidents with the dogs as far as, or any actual contact where you had to use a dog for what he was? Actually, no. Uh, I was lucky in that respect that uh, we never got to the point where I had to let my dog go on anyone. There was very few guys that had to do that. Um, but I do remember in a couple incidents, uh, I was on a post on the north part of the base one night, and all of a sudden there was rounds coming in. And they were, you know, it was um, weapons fire, not, not mortars or rockets. But the, uh, we, and I don't remember the sequence of whether this was before or after something, so all these things are kind of jumbled together. Although I do have one date I'll tell you about that I remember specifically, but... Uh, so myself and the guy on the next post were pretty close together. All of a sudden, we just jumped in a ditch. We had heard an explosion, and then all this, all this uh, automatic weapons fire started. What happened was north of us, not, I don't know how, how far the road was north of us, uh, a South Vietnamese truck had hit a landmine in the road. And the guys who survived probably thought they were under attack, and they just started shooting in all directions. So we are taking fire from probably friendlies, but, you know, they weren't shooting at us. The bullets were just coming that way. So that was one of the incidents. Uh, myself and another guy, one time on the east, west end of the, west end of the uh, base, we had, we had our post co come together and we were talking to each other for just a minute. And uh, I think it was... We're probably maybe as far away as you and I are, maybe four or five feet at that. And all of a sudden you hear a round go between us. So there must have been a sniper out there. Luckily he wasn't that good, so neither one of us got hit. And on that same post one night, I heard a lot of automatic weapons fire uh, off in the distance. Maybe, I'd say maybe a quarter mile away. You could see their tracer rounds going. And the... Uh, so I called it in, and they sent what they called Spooky, which was C-47s out. They dropped three flares, and it was like the sun came up. Next morning, we found out that 17 South Vietnamese soldiers in a, in a place got wiped out just outside the base. So, And then the one that I remember big time was happened on May 12th of 1967. And the reason this date is in my mind is I had exactly three years in the Air Force the night it happened. I, I, I just finished what they call quartering your post. You go down and you, you do your, your checks along the fence line. We had three fence lines around the base. We had the outer fence and, an inner, and a center fence, and between the outer and center one for trip flares, and then you had landmines between the center one and the inner fence. So the trip flares would, would go off if somebody you know hit one trying to get in there. And... Uh, 
the uh, after I did that, I went and sat on my bunker for for a minute. I was looking around. All of a sudden, I hear these weird noises behind me. I look and I see explosions. So these buildings are getting hit. So uh, three days before that, one of our canine guys got into a firefight with some uh, Vietnamese trying to get in, and they killed two of them and captured one. And they said we're going to be uh, hit. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to get a rocket and mortar attack followed by a ground assault. So all 46 dog teams were out that night. And we went to... Uh, we heard the mortars and rockets coming in. And for some reason, I was down on an area that was like this. It wasn't a ditch, but the land went this way up to those three fences I was telling you about. And I was down in, in the bottom of it, and I heard this whistling noise, which is what I told you before, that that combat school, the ground burst, well, the ground burst simulators, but they also have a whistle. You've probably heard those before, too. They come in, and they... It sounds like a mortar round coming in. So I just hit the deck, put my arm over my dog's head, and about 15 feet away from me, uh, I actually saw the mortar round hit and explode. But because of the angle and the way they blow up, I didn't even feel concussion from it. Really? And so I was very lucky, very lucky. I, if I was standing up, I probably would have been hit by something. But I was on the ground, and uh, after that was over, we got up and we had these old French bunkers and the um, the machine gun guys up there because of what the intel was about the ground attack was uh, they were just pepper in the tree line, you know. So I was doing the same thing. I was popping flares, you know, shooting into the woods, but you didn't see anybody. But, you know, the thing was you react because if somebody's out there, you got enough firepower, they're either going to stop what they're doing or you're going to going to take care of them but and then i saw they had uh, these uh, these forward air control planes they're like uh, little piper cubs and i saw one fly by later on you can see the pilot in it. he had the thing he had a light on in the, in the cockpit but the plane was so low going around the base to check it out you know and after that was all over you saw helicopters way down the other end of the base they were tracer rounds going down and stuff. So, but it was all over. I did what I was supposed to do with my training. And then when I got back in my bunker, I was like this for about an hour later. You didn't have time to think what was going on. You know, people say you don't get scared, but it, it's a delayed scared when you have time to think about it. And then when I came back, <coughs> after I got off duty that morning, came back and the barracks... We had a bunch of hooches in line. Mine was here, the one just behind it, like this, got it, took a direct rocket mortar attack. There was like 20 guys in there. Nobody in that barracks was killed. They were pretty bad. Behind it, I knew a guy, his, his name was Horace Holbrook. He was a security guy, but he was in the barracks behind us. He was sitting on the side of his bunk, and I guess a piece of the thing came in and just basically cut him in half. Killed him right there. He's from Alabama. And actually, when I looked at the damage in our barracks, or a hut, it was like, I was lucky to be on post because I had trapped the holes in my locker and in my bunk, in my mattress. So luckily I wasn't sleeping. You know. But those were the big things that happened. Well, how was, was uh, when you had that all that activity going on and the, the mortar land so close to your proximity how did the dog handle all that it was good i mean you know because we used to take them to the firing range so they were used to the guns going off uh i don't remember having a problem with them at all you pretty much just carried on like yeah just another day on the that's dog. it and i'll never forget though my buddy from alabama who was stationed with me in westover he was on the very next post and to this day i can tell you exactly what he said when they got on the truck because he had seen me before the mortar round went off he says, man, I was never so, so glad to see you get get on the truck. He says, I thought you got hit, you know. So you don't forget things like that, you know. But it was uh, it was quite an experience over there, you know. And then, uh, then I was lucky enough, um, myself and a guy from 
Kentucky, we decided to go to our R and R together. We went to Sydney, Australia, for a week. That was that was kind of neat, you know. Have some real good food, although the food on the base wasn't that bad, you know. But uh, nice and peaceful. It was too quiet though, you know, with no airplanes going off, no artillery going off. So, you know. what was your? Were you getting three hots a day? Being you was right there on 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 base. That's pretty much where your whole tour was for the most part. Yes. So did you yeah. get three hots a day, or were you having? Well, we had rations, we had sea rations when we went on post at night. So we. Most of the guys, including myself, we'd come in off post. We get off. Normally, I was on like an eight at night till four in the morning shift. So once I, we got off, we before we went to bed, we go chow, and then we'd have uh, a hot meal for lunch, and then our supper would be basically the sea rations, which the dog got part of too. So, but you get extra portion, you get extras for the dog, or uh, you have to no? Share and then and then if you're running CQ, you had to feed the dogs in the morning. And the dogs usually got a, a pound of Gaines Prime and a can of horse meat. That was their one meal a day, besides what we would give them, you know, so. It was, it was, it was neat. And it was, it was kind of tough leaving, you know, the dog behind, but you knew that he still had a job to do, you know. And he went through probably one and a half handlers after I left because... They had to put him down in 1969 because of a, a, a fractured pelvis. And I'm still trying to research uh, whether it happened or an attack on the base or not. But my fortunate thing was coming back as I, I came back to the U.S. on the 14th of January, 1968, 17 days before the Tet Offensive. I was very lucky. And I talked to a bunch of guys I was with who were still there at that time. And my dog was part of that with a new hammer. That base get pretty hit pretty hard as part of the Tet Offensive. Yeah, the uh, most of the, the Battle of Bunker Hill Ten was. Uh, I've got an article downstairs on that, and uh, I I talked to a guy who was there, and they said uh, not. They counted 158 dead VC. We lost one, two. I think there was only maybe three cops killed that night. But uh, they, they stood their ground, and one, our operations officer, who I knew, was killed that night, and he was put in for the Medal of Honor, but I don't know, they say it was, I don't know if they said it was political or what, but they gave the Air Force Cross posthumously, but they've got a building name for him down in uh, in uh, Washington, in uh, at, uh, Boeing Air Force Base, Captain Reginald Macy. So, and while I was there, too, and I don't remember when this was, there was a... Uh, uh, a guy, made it, his last name was Bridges. I can't remember his first name. He was a he was a security, and he was killed. Uh, was wearing a backpack radio, PRC seventy seven, and got struck by lightning in a guard tower. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and he was from Granby. Oh, from really? Granby, Connecticut. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Bridges. I can't remember his first name right now. I've got it somewhere. So uh, your your tour came to an end. Yeah. Closed down. Um, just before we leave Vietnam, what was? Did you have a lot of good communication back home with, with your family? Oh yeah, your letters all the time and everything. Yes, yeah. My grandmother used to write me a letter all the time, put a dollar bill in it, you know, and stuff like that, you know. So we'd have to change it over to uh, piastres, which was the Vietnamese money, but. Uh, yeah, my parents wrote me all the time. Uh, my wife, who was my girlfriend, was writing me. You know, I got letters from a lot of people, a lot of my friends around here and stuff. So it was always, always good communication. Yeah. Okay, so I'm sure uh, you were excited. And you thought it was, did you know, you know, months out with the day you are going to leave? Or how did you find out that you're actually now I'm finally leaving Vietnam? Actually, when I came back from Australia, my R&R, &R, uh, I knew what my date was supposed to be, which would, uh, was supposed to be the 17th or 18th of January, which was the date that I deployed over. But when I got back, there was a, I had my orders, and it was the 14th of January. So I found out then when I was coming back, and uh, actually I saw when I stayed overnight before I processed out of Travis Air Force Base, 
I found out, I, I saw two dog handlers that were from the unit. They had extended for a year, came home, and they were heading back when I was coming, when I was there. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> when you came back, where, where, did, where did you go and how, how much longer were you in? You weren't in too much longer. After no, that. actually I wasn't in at all because uh, we had, I had three years and eight months and four days. Uh, that I had been in at that time. I don't know why that sticks in my mind, you know, that time. But uh, And when I, uh, when I got back, you had two choices. You could either re-up or you'd get out because if you had less than six months, they weren't going to reassign you. It just wasn't cost-effective. So I decided to get out. I said, I'm not standing in any more lines or anything like that and stuff. So I decided, well, that's it. I'll, uh, I'll get out. To go home, do something, and uh, and it was kind of funny too because, you know, not everybody, you know, a lot of people just didn't like what we did. They, they were against not only the war, but didn't have much use for us coming back either. But I was fortunate that I never really ran into any of those situations. In fact, I processed out of Travis, went to San Francisco. And that night I got a hotel room because I was catching a plane the next day. So they had a terminal, bus terminal, that went to the airport. So you go to that bus terminal, you pick up one. And this guy sitting next to me is a TWA agent. So we started talking. He used to be in the Air Force. So, you know, I'm still in uniform for travel. So we, I told him where I was coming from and all this stuff. And uh, went and bought my $85 standby ticket from San Francisco to New York. Wouldn't it be nice if those were still the prices? <laughs> but uh, so he says, so he says, come on, I'm going to take you in. I'm buying you breakfast, you know, kind of welcome you back. So he took me in the employee's cafeteria, bought me breakfast that morning. So he says, I'll see you when you get to the gate. So I get to the gate, you know, I thanked him for breakfast and everything. So I start to go this way. He says, no, you're going first class. So he sent me back first class on the plane. So I had a nice steak and stuff, you know, and everybody on the plane was really nice to me. And then I got to uh, to uh, JFK and there was no flights coming into Bradley. So I had to get down to New York and this was kind of cool because I was able to, uh, went to the Pan Am building and got on a Pan Am helicopter that took us to the 58th floor of the Pan Am building at night. Uh, which was right over Grand Central Station. They, it doesn't fly anymore. They've had some crashes there years and years ago, but it was really cool flying in a helicopter, a civilian helicopter, between buildings at night in New York City. And then they put you on the express elevator, go down there. and Then I got a train to Hartford, and uh, I was talking to a guy on the train. You know, He didn't agree with the war, but he wasn't giving me a hard time or anything. And uh, I got a bus, so I, I didn't call anybody. I got a bus to take me home, which was two houses from where we live now, and just showed up and surprised everybody. But the bus driver, when he found out I was coming back, he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, take any money. He says, no, this is a free ride. So I was treated, you know, I didn't have a problem, you know, with that. And then I came back and uh, they had a, I think it was like a $300 bonus or something you could get if you served over there. So I went down to one of the state buildings, wherever it was, and I'll never forget this. I get in the elevator, I got the paperwork in my hand, and the gentleman in the elevator says, are you going up to put in for your bonus? I said, yeah. He says, I'll show you where it is. I'm going right there. So he took my paperwork and stuff, went, and I don't know, man, it must have been fast. I had to check the next day <laughs> from the state. Yeah, that was kind of funny. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So... You're back home. Everybody's happy to see you. Yep. And that wasn't the end, though, because you are a retired master sergeant. Yeah, so. Course. So so what, why did you go back in the service? I think you went in the Army Guard first, and then you kind of. No, actually, I what happened was I uh, I worked for a year. I went in, uh, in January. I got a, a job at Hamilton here, and I was a uh, crib attendant in uh, Space and Life. They were developing the spacesuit and stuff like that. 
And it just became a boring job. You know, you'd sit there, wait for somebody to come to get something, and there was really nothing for you to do. So about, uh, I think it was in, I want to say, I, I left there and I went to work with my dad, who was a carpenter. My brother was a carpenter, too, and uh, worked with them for a while. I decided to go to college. But while I was doing that in uh, February of 69, I... I said, well, I'm going to give it a shot. I went up to the Air National Guard and talked to the guy in the security police unit. And they had an opening. And so I came in there as a, I was an E-4 at the time. And uh, I, uh, I spent a year there. And I had signed up for, I think it was three. No, was it three? I don't know. I, I don't know if I did a try one or what, but I decided a year later to get out because I was going to college and I think it was kind of interfering with it. So I spent a year in the security police here, and then in 73, just before I graduated, I think I joined in April of 73, I joined the uh, Army Guard in Rockville. It was a recon platoon. And I didn't think we did enough on the weekends, so I, I decided to get out. But the training we had was great, and I think it helped my security police career later on. I ended up... Uh, at, uh, in uh, Rockville in the recon platoon. So we went, we went to AP Hill, Virginia one year. We trained with, with special forces. They taught us uh, daytime and nighttime combat and uh, recon patrols. Uh, we did um, uh, map and compass, you know, we did uh, land navigation. Uh, in fact, we were the first company to get back and we had to wait for all the other guys to start raining after we got back, so they were still out in the woods, you know. But we did uh, helicopter assault landings. We they taught us to repel off of uh, off of towers, and we repelled out of helicopters. And it was great training, but we didn't really use it back here, you know. So I ended up joining the security police unit at Westover, and that was in uh, November '73. I went up there, and I was part of the 901st Weapon System Security Flight. And I was in there, and I did some air shows. I worked on air shows and stuff, did two weeks of training there. Never really deployed anywhere, but I was there till 76, till I got laid off. I was working for an airline catering outfit just down the street. So I was in Hartford looking for a job. Job opened up at Bradley, uh, and they were tr starting a new security thing. They had contract security at the time. So what they were doing was putting... putting uh, you had to be a member of the Guard, and you had to be a member of security police in order to have the job. So I'd already been there a year, went up talked to the guy after I got laid off, and then I talked to my commander, and within three days they had me transferred from the Guard, which I, I were from the reserves to the Guard. I had made E6 up there, but they didn't have a slot, so I took a reduction in rank to E7, or E7, E5, I'm going the wrong way here. <laughs> and so I said, what the heck, I need a job full time. It was right up here three miles away. And uh, after a time, I think it was 85, they turned it into a protective services job on the full time side. But I stayed in the guard also. So they grandfathered us back and I had 22 years at, uh, of hazardous duty with the state and retired from there when I was 52 with a full pension right away. But on, uh, on the guard side, I stayed in, got my text right back. I made uh, E7. I had I had like 12 years in, couldn't go any further. So I stayed. I was in E7 for the for my last 10 years in. And uh, they were there was a thing that started sometimes in the 80s that I think it was mid 80s. I was talking to a guy the other day about it. Around 85 and to some place in the middle of 90s. If you were an E7 and you had over 20 years, uh, it was time for you to go. So myself and about five other guys, four or five other guys got that. I said, yeah, time's up, you know, but E7 is not a bad right to get out at. And uh, so I spent till December 9, 1990 is when I retired from the Air Guard. And uh, during that time, I went on a lot of security police conferences. I went to some schools. Uh, so I've been all over the country as far as that goes. A couple of deployments we had. We, we had a two-week deployment. We 
provided security for the aircraft out at Indian Springs Auxiliary Airfield, which is about 50 miles outside of Vegas. That was back in 19, oh gosh, I think it was 1980. And we did security for the A-10s and stuff like that. And that was the first time I'd ever been out in that area. But we lived in tents. We had to bring all our gear. We lived in squad tents there. And, you know, that's where our mess hall was in a, in a tent and stuff. And it, it was pretty, pretty hot out there. It was on the flight line, it was like 120 degrees during the day. But uh, it, was, it was interesting. I deployed to um, Germany. I was over there for a couple of uh, weeks. Uh, we had to do uh, security for our A-10s. We were at, uh, north of Bremerhaven is a, uh, Nordholz was the name of the place. It was a, a German Navy base. They had what's the equivalent of our Navy P-3s here, submarine hunters there. So our planes deployed there and we had, uh, we just set up security there for the A-10s that were over there. So that was a nice, Nice thing. Got to see parts of Germany and, you know, uh, remember going to a Catholic church, could not understand what the priest was saying, but I could follow the mass because it was just the same way it was here. And uh, I went to England in 1983, uh, spent 19 days there in um, RAF Weathersfield. It was a small base. There was no aircraft there. It was a, a Red Horse base, which is the same thing as the uh, engineers and the Seabees. But that's the Air Force counterpart of it. Uh, so we had the A-10s there, and we got to go into London and stuff like that. So it was, it was kind of neat. And then uh, my conferences around the country and stuff like that. And I've, I was, uh, I've done everything from being the operations NCO, training NCO. I was in charge of, I did security clearances for like 10 years. And, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff, so. Have you, uh, are you involved in any um, veterans programs like VFW or? I've been a member of the uh, American Legion for 35 years. In fact, we, uh, I was in Windsor for like up until 2011, but the post is not, there's only a couple guys left. Mm -hmm. So the post's not really doing that well. And I ended up going to um, East Windsor because back in 2011, they had the traveling wall come, mm -hmm. and uh, there was an article that came out. They were looking for somebody at dog handlers because they wanted to uh, honor the war dogs. So I got in touch with the guy and uh, actually ended up meeting a gentleman who was in Vietnam with me in the same unit. Uh, I got a hold of him before that, and uh, he lives in Southington, but I'd never seen him until 2011. He left in May of '67. And uh, so it was, it was pretty neat. So we, what they did was they made a wreath of silver, my dog, and we, the Army National Guard, which uh, has the only active duty canine unit in the United States uh, for a guard unit, they brought five handlers of dogs up and they were our escorts to lay this wreath on a, on a kennel that they had brought up. So that was, that was kind of neat. So... Nice. Well, it's good that you got to follow through and see what happened with your dog. Also. Yeah, yeah. I imagine a lot of people never really knew what happened no. with their dog after they, they moved on. Yeah, I, I, I've got a copy of a letter here that I can uh, give you to scan or I can, you know, however you want to do it. Uh, I had called Lackland Air Force Base, the DOD Dog Training Center, and a guy looked it up. He gave me the card that shows where the dog came from, the owner and everything. In fact, I've actually talked to the son of the owner of the dog uh, a few years back, but never got anything from him. He was looking for some old pictures of Silver when he was a pup, but uh, and also all the a listing of all the handlers and the uh, the gentleman who sent it wrote a nice letter to me. So I I've got a good history on on Silver. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, well, John, is there anything else you want to discuss that we have not covered yet? No, I don't think so. Oh, well, one of the things is I just want to tell you that the job that I ended up working full-time for the uh, Air Guard, which ended up being a full-time state position, was because of my training in the Air Force as a security policeman. That's why I was able to get that job. And it was, I mean, 22, 22 years, three miles from home is not a bad deal to work. No, you know? no, that worked and, out uh, well. And I'm a 
because you're working out of Central, I am a 1973 graduate of Central. Yeah, so so Central alum. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for your service, and uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to allow us to interview you today. Well, I'm, you know, it, it brought back some more memories, and uh, I'm glad glad I had the opportunity to do this. Thank you for having me.